One, a baby is not born with any idea of a society, no sense whatever of other people. Its mother exists principally, in fact entirely, for him or her, and its father exists somewhat later, entirely for him or her. It's only much, much later that the baby begins to realize that the parent on whom he depended for everything and whom he supposed held up the world is in fact just another human being who was not invented for him. That is, on the most primary level, one of the meanings of an education. On another level, it is the only way that one is enabled to enlarge the world. Now that sounds like a very grandiose phrase. All it means is that when you, for example, begin to read, you discover more about the world than you knew before. You discover more about the world in two ways, and this is why it is important. There being, in fact, two worlds. One world is you. That this, this, this envelope, I'm a world. I'm not the only world, that's my problem. But I'm a world, and I got, I'm under the obligation to discover whatever it is that goes on in that world. And in order to do that, I have got to consent to become a social animal in order to discover and to enlarge what goes on in this world, which is all of you and many millions of people, both living and dead, past and to come. And finally, this is where it begins to be difficult, the measure of one's dignity depends on one's estimate of oneself. It really does not depend, as so many people in this country now seem to believe, on someone else's estimate. It depends, first of all, on what you take yourself to be, what your real standards are, what you think is right, what you think is wrong, what you think life is all about, what you think life is for. Now, you are all very young. And I say that, by the way, with great humility. You are all still unformed. Well, let me put it another way. You are not finally formed. And you are still, to put it brutally, I want to put it brutally because I want to make my point absolutely clear, you are still at the mercy of your elders. You are still at the mercy of the standards of your elders. Let us go back again to the whole concept of education. And bear in mind, then, that education does not and cannot occur in a vacuum. It occurs in a social context. It occurs in a social context, and it has social ends. For example, to take a very brutal example, the children of the Third Reich were educated by the Third Reich in order to fulfill the purposes of the Third Reich. Hitler did this on a very old principle, the principle referred to oh, by priest and in the Bible, and which every parent somewhere knows, if you give me the child for five years, I'll have him the rest of his life. So that if that is so, one has then got to be aware that one of the purposes of an education, your responsibility before your educators, is to question the purpose of this education. In Let me give you, then, your education is occurring within a given context at a certain time in history, in a certain country, at a certain time in its history. In fact, at a very crucial time in its history. 
If, for example, well, I'll be personal about this. When I was going to school, a school not very unlike this one, though not as pretty, I began to be bugged by the teaching of American history. I began to be bugged by the teaching of American history because it seemed that that history had been accomplished without my presence. And this had a very demoralizing effect on me when I was your age and younger and had a demoralizing effect for quite a few years thereafter. Now, that may seem to be trivial, but speaking now as though I were your educator, as though I were your teacher, my responsibility to you would be to invest you with all of the morale that I could to prepare you for the terrible storm which is called life. Terrible and beautiful. But you must know that it is both. And you don't quite know it, and it's my responsibility to make you know it. It's my responsibility also, speaking now as your educator, to give you as true a version of your history as I can, since it is through your sense of your own history that you arrive at your identity. And no one has ever arrived at a sense of his own identity without it. This is why ancestors are important. We, all of us here now, are living through a certain kind of turmoil which endangers all of our relationships. This turmoil is sometimes described as racial. We can use that word for the moment, but it is really not racial. It is historical and it is personal. Let me speak again about the aims of a society as opposed now to the aims of an education. The aims of a society are and always must be to inculcate in its citizens a certain sense of security and to discourage its citizens from disturbing the peace. Now, this is a necessity, and it is even an, an admirable necessity, because we cannot live without society, and society, as a fact, is a very beautiful creation. Nevertheless, it is also equally true that all societies have been brought into existence very painfully and very slowly by men and the people who are responsible for the creation of societies must forever ask questions, all questions, take nothing whatever for granted because that is the only way the frontiers of the world fall back and the world, as I said before, begins to be enlarged. So that this means that though a society is under the obligation to educate all of its citizens, it is also under the obligation to discourage people from thinking too much. Now this is where all of you come in. My responsibility, again, if I'm your teacher, is to teach you to think. This is not an easy thing to do. If I want you to think, I must teach you to think about everything. I must teach you that there is a reason for everything you do, and that you must find that reason. If, for example, and now I'll, I will be personal, I'm afraid, but I mean it in the best possible way. If I were your teacher, 
And let us say I was dealing with one of you who, let's say in this case, would be a Negro of about 16 or 17. And I knew that you were beginning to wonder what you were doing in school in the first place and what waited for you outside, what good was it to be here since you, nothing that happened to you here prepared you for outside. Knowing your bitterness and not trying for a moment to pretend it is not justified, I would yet have to suggest to you that the problems that you face, you would have to make them personal. And then I would ask you very rude questions. For example, I would ask you, if you were a boy, why you dressed the way you did, and if your hair was conked, I would ask you to ask yourself, why? To come back again, this is a very small example of what I mean, to the war between society and thought. It is your responsibility as the young American citizens to understand that the standards by which you are confronted and by which many of you are visibly and obviously victimized and others of you, not so obviously, but equally victimized, are not the only standards in the world. There is no reason for anybody to want to look like a Greek god that is not the world's only standard of beauty. And furthermore, the virtues to which we all in one way or another aspire of a comfortable life, which is to say a middle class life, are not the only virtues. I come from a very poor family and there's a vast amount of vitality, which is a very definite virtue, to be found in those circumstances. Finally, if I were your teacher, I would beg you to insist to fight with me and not let me get away with anything. No matter how I may sound, I am really only mortal, and though I love you very much and feel responsible for you, I'm not always right. We depend on each other, the old and the young, to learn from each other. I would beg you to ask me why, for example, your history books are the way they are. And I would beg you to force me to answer if you asked me what relevance your education had for concrete problems such as getting an apartment, moving from one, town, one part of town to another. I would, if I were you, I would force me, I would put me on the spot, ask me the most difficult questions that you can. And I will not be able to answer them. But my responsibility is to hear them. And when you ask your question, any question, you begin to know more about what you really think. That's all I have to say. Now you're going to ask me questions. Yes. The first question Mr. Baldwin was asked, 
Do you think that black people in America should learn African history and culture to gain pride and dignity and strength? So when we are confronted by white people, we can say that we have a culture which is at the very least equal to white people's and at the very most, well, we're not sure what it's equal to. I'm going to try to answer your question as clearly as I can. It's not an easy question to answer. I can say, first of all, yes. Yes. But be careful. Find out all you can. But don't find it out with the intention of proving a point. Understand this. There is no reason for you to prove yourself to anybody except yourself. When, when the world talks about culture, understand this. It is not talking about culture. It is talking about power. The difference between the African cultures, which have vanished, and the European cultures, which are decaying, is that Europe had the power. And that is the only difference. It's not that Europe was civilized and Africans were not. That's a lie. Do you understand that? And find out all you can about what happened when you got here. But you haven't got to prove it to anybody. All you've got to do is know it. You're a man, baby. Please don't be shy. Go on. What? what force do you think wins out most of this? The next question. What force do you think wins out more often in this war about education? Society or thought? Well, which force wins out more often? To tell you the truth? Well, I don't know. It's a question. It would seem that society wins out. And in an obvious and visible way, society usually does. After all, history is full of martyrs who went to various deaths because society didn't like what they had to say. But on the other hand, one remembers most of those people and one does not remember all societies. So it's a question of what you think is most important. I'll tell you what I think. Thought is most important. Don't try to be safe. Nobody, will, nobody ever is safe. Next he was asked, Mr. Baldwin, in your essay to your nephew, you said the Negro has to accept those that are innocent. Can you tell us how we can distinguish those who are innocent from those who are guilty? got me. <laughs> Wait a minute. In the essay that you're talking about, I was telling my nephew, who is you, let's say, that he had to accept these innocent people. And these innocent people are your countrymen, white Americans. I was trying to suggest to you that though this may be very hard to understand and always will be until you die. People are not wicked because they do wicked things. I know that sounds like a terrible kind of cop-out. But the reason I want to suggest it to you is because I want you to know that there is nothing that has been done to you that you aren't capable of doing to someone else. And I don't want to see you do that. I want you, as I was trying to tell our friend over here, to realize 
that you've got nothing to prove. And that whoever doesn't know who you are, and whoever is afraid of you, is to be pitied, and ho you can hope to correct him, but I beg you not to hate him. As for who is innocent and who is guilty, nobody knows. Nobody knows. That's the point. That's the best answer I can give you, but you keep thinking about it. Mr. Baldwin, in the same book, you wrote that the terrible thing is not the whites must accept the Negroes, but that the Negroes must accept the whites. Please explain this. I will try to explain that. Um, well, it's a terrible effort at some point in one's life to make, and it's a terrible effort to tell you the truth throughout one's life. And you only begin to succeed in this effort, I must say, when you reduce people to individuals and release them from the mass. The reason it's hard is because one has been, and this is not the fault of any white, one white person that one is likely to meet, but the white culture has operated and has operated deliberately to demoralize all black people. And the demoralization has in many cases been fatal and in all cases has been sinister. The effort, therefore, that I must make to arrive at my identity is mainly in opposition to the, for, to the white force of the world. Under such a tension, it becomes very difficult. And then, under such a tension, I must repeat, it becomes absolutely necessary to deal with people as people, only as people. Because you cannot spend your life, this is my point, trying to be revenged for historical crimes. If you do that, you will destroy yourself and you will perpetuate the crime. The thing, the thing to aim at, this is why it is a terrible necessity to accept white people, but it's a terrible necessity on the part of white people, even harder necessity to accept Negroes because in order for white people to accept a Negro, they've got to accept their history and something much deeper and worse than that. They've got to accept, if I may now be brutal and rude, but I mean this and you must think about it. If you remember, that everything that you will do all your life and everything that you will say reveals you. What I call you doesn't say anything about you, or very rarely. But what I call you says everything about me. Now, there is a very good reason, which has nothing to do with Negroes, why white people call them nigger. It's a white invention. And in order for white people to be released from this invention, they will have to discover where this nigger really lives. And he lives inside white people. And they have to accept him, that stranger within, before they can accept anybody without. That is what I was trying to say. The next question, what is your opinion of the black Muslims and other black nationalist movements? My opinion of the black Muslim movement and other black nationalist movements, let us be precise. I would oppose with all my energy your joining such a movement for two reasons. If one is weary of the doctrine of white supremacy, and if one is cognizant of the crimes committed in the name of this myth, 
one cannot possibly now turn the medal over and call it black supremacy and embark on the same terrifying road, which will end up in the same place. As a black nationalist, one has got to be very careful. Words mean something. If you are a black nationalist, you must be in Africa. It is a hard fact, but it is a fact, and one has got to use it. This is your country. And no matter what you call yourself, you are an American. You have been here for 400 years, and your ancestors helped create this country. I don't think that you should abandon it for two reasons. You will not find another country, and I know because I've tried. You will simply not have this one. And you will not, to that extent, that you don't have this one, you will not have yourself. And furthermore, I must beg you to remember this, to think about this very carefully. I know how enraged one can be, but at no matter what price, you must try to be clear. You can lose your temper for a second and lose 30 years of your life. Words mean something, and in that case, you must ask yourself what a black nationalist is, and then you must ask yourself, if you attempted to join the black Muslim movement, if that peculiar version of history is any truer or any sounder than the version of history which afflicts you now. We don't need any more myths. Let's try to tell the truth. What do you think of Martin Luther King's nonviolent movement in the South? What do I think of the Martin Luther King's nonviolent movement in the South? Well, I think two things. I'll try to be clear about it. I admire Martin very much, and, Mark, and Reverend King's work is incredible. And I personally am opposed to violence. I will say this, too, that Martin has done tremendous work in the six years since Montgomery. And I don't think he could have done it in any other way. But if you remember what I told you earlier, everything must be questioned. The technique of nonviolence has obvious limits. It has this limit that people are not by nature nonviolent. And it costs, it would cost you, if you were down there now, a terrible effort which you, from which you might not recover. You would have to endure what you would have to endure at the hands of those people. Therefore, your question, to be honest with you, finds me very much where you are. I think that the entire strategy has got to be rethought in order to minimize the damage to you. I have not yet come up with a satisfactory answer, but I will, I will do my best. And you think about it too, okay? Little girl, yes. Why isn't American Negro history taught as part of the Western education program? Why isn't American Negro history taught as part of the Western educational program? Well, let me say something very rude, but this is the truth. The reason it is not taught is because a power structure power structure and all societies, as I said before, are ba when I told the boy before, the difference between Europe and Africa was not that one was civilized and one was not, but that one, was on, one had power and one did not. I meant it. That is also the reason that American Negro history is not taught. You were, at one time, and are still considered to be by many segments of this population, a source of cheap labor. 
if I am the white man and I have you in a certain place and I need you there, then it is important for me not to let you have any suspicion that you don't belong in that place. That is essentially the reason. Now that's, that's the root reason. There are reasons on top of it, but that's the, that is the reason at bottom. You see what I mean? Now, if I were your teacher, I would ask you to do me a favor and insist that you appear in those textbooks, even if, even if they had to burn all the textbooks which now exist. I would insist on it, if I were you, for my sake, as well as for yours. You see what I mean?